All right, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the next lecture in uh, 6858 in our series of lectures about network security. So today's lecture is going to be about certificates, which uh, follows from the discussion on Monday about the TLS protocol that gets used over the network to establish a secure channel. So just to remind you guys, that's okay. So one thing is we're trying this new format with a board and a person working in front of it. Let us know what you like more. We can sort of switch things up as need be. Um, the other is ask questions. You can ask in the chat and a TA will answer or relay your question, or you can answer or ask a question live by unmuting in Zoom. And we'd love to have an interactive session as well. Um, so to start off, before I dive into the details of certificates, I wanted to uh, get you guys in sort of the mood to ask questions and track a little bit. So I wanted to pose a question to uh, some of you. Uh, in particular, um, the last couple of readings have been about real networks that you guys use day to day. Um, so one thing I was uh, hoping to ask you is uh, how has this series of papers and perhaps this last paper about certificates changed uh, your approach to how do you deal with your own networking in a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so let me pick off a couple of students off the participant list to see what you guys think. Um, so maybe I'll pick on uh, Alexander Craig. Uh, if you're around, can you unmute and uh, say what you think of uh, sort of this paper with relation to your daily life? Um, I don't think it's changed much. I noticed, uh, I don't think I've ever clicked on the lock icon uh, in my browser before, but I did that and uh, there was some certificates and cookies and stuff. Right. Makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's sort of under the covers and, uh, you know, to a large extent it does sort of work and you don't need to understand, I think, a whole lot uh, if you want some basic guarantees. Uh, on the other hand, it might be useful, I guess, if you're developing some application uh, going forward. Uh, so let me just pick off uh, another student, maybe uh, uh, Jason Paulus. Are you around? Well, maybe not. Let me pick someone else. Uh, hey, Keshav Gupta, uh, if you're around, do you, do you have a, what's your reaction to these papers and reality? <laughs> um, so I have, I, I had a vague understanding of like what cookies were doing and what like the lock icon on the corner meant. Um, but I think after reading, reading these papers, I have, I have a sort of a clearer idea um, uh -huh. as to what's going on. And yeah, I've also become uh, slightly um, worried about my safety on the internet. Like I'm like, I would obviously not think about all these actions before, but now I'm like thinking for a bit before every action that I perform online. All so, right. Yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly, you know, like one reaction is paranoia, uh, but uh, you know, so some degree maybe is healthy. Um, but yeah, it's sort of maybe the main thing, as you mentioned, to take away is really an understanding of what's going on so that you can have the right expectations from the system and not trust it when it's maybe not warranted. So, all right, so let's uh, get going. And uh, again, feel free to chime in at any point, ask questions. Um, so the certificate story sort of starts off in the browser when the user decides to visit some website like HTTPS, they type in a URL, amazon.com, for example. And the story is gonna involve their client here uh, talking to some server over the network. So here might be Amazon's web server. And uh, for the time being, we're going to take a simplified version of the TLS protocol that we discussed on Monday. And imagine a situation like the client uh, sending a message to the server saying it wants to connect. And then the server is going to respond back with its public key, PKS. And now, this is uh, where the simplification comes in to some extent, the client is going to send the server an encrypted key to use. And it's going to encrypt this key with the public key of the server. And it's going to be this key K. And at this point, uh, these guys can continue now exchanging messages encrypted under this session key K that they've set up. And the property that this protocol sort of aims to provide is some kind of protection against uh, network adversaries. And the data that we're gonna be sending back and forth here uh, under the key K is gonna be just the regular HTTP protocol that you guys have been struggling with all throughout lab one, uh, lab two, et cetera. So the question is, how much does this buy us in the simplified version of TLS without any certificates added? So it depends a little bit on the network adversary that we're considering. If the adversary just sort of sits back and looks at what's going on on the network, the adversary might 
not be able to get the data because they can't get the key because the key was only ever sent encrypted with the server's public key PKS. And the corresponding secret key only lives on the server, not accessible to the adversary as long as the adversary doesn't break into the server computer. So it seems like a positive version of this story, but the problem is that the adversary might be more active. So what I've described so far is a passive adversary just watches the network. And this protocol is good for that. But if the adversary steps in and starts intercepting network messages, then we're in a bit more trouble. So in particular, one way, one mindset you should have when I'm trying to understand network protocols is not to actually think of diagrams like what I have on the board that describe the state of the whole world, but really think myopically in terms of what's going on at one participant in the network. So the way to think of it in this myopic style is ignore the server. We don't know what's going on on the right-hand side of the board, so let me block it off. And what's going on from the client is the client transmits a message out into thin air saying connect. And some time later, a public key comes back on the wire. What happened? I don't know, but I got a public key. So that's sort of the right mindset to have in the sense that we don't actually know where our connect message went and where the public key came back from. And the reason you might actually have this pessimal mindset is that the underlying network is not particularly secure. Uh, as you saw last week in the lecture about TCP and IP security, the adversary might somehow impersonate the DNS record or sort of poison the DNS entry for amazon.com causing a client to connect to the wrong IP address. Or maybe the adversary hijacks the IP address of Amazon through BGP attacks. Or maybe the adversary is listening on your wireless network and just grabs your wireless packet and jams it so it doesn't get transmitted further along. So in this mindset of the adversary having control of the network itself, we have to worry about our messages not actually reaching this intended good server on the right hand side. And in this situation, what we might have is the picture might still look like this, except this server S is not amazon.com, but it's actually the evil attacker. Nothing in this picture committed us to this server being the right Amazon machine. So this illustrates the big problem that certificates are going to be trying to solve, which is key distribution. So figuring out basically which KS or which uh, PKS the client should be using is really the big question here. And this is a pretty common theme in network protocols in uh, security which is that the encryption is reasonably straightforward, if you will. There's technical details to get right, as we talked about on Monday, but there's well understood protocols for doing that. But the hard question to answer is, what public key should I be using when talking to someone over the network using an encrypted network protocol? And there's many potential answers. So this paper is about certificates, and that's one answer that makes sense in the context of web security. There's other answers. So one thing you might do is manually distribute this key through USB sticks or print them out on business cards. You could use some scheme like Kerberos, which MIT uses pretty widely and other uh, systems do as well, which has a slightly different plan than certificates. Uh, there's other schemes like Keybase, which we'll have a guest speaker talk about later in this uh, course in a couple of weeks. But for the, for the purpose of this lecture, we're gonna try to answer the question of authenticating this public key of the server using this uh, certificate construction. Make sense? That's the problem we're gonna be trying to solve. Interrupt if you have questions. And the solution of what this uh, sort of certificate approach looks like is that we'll have an entity over here called the certificate authority, or CA for short. And logically, there's gonna be two interesting things going on at the certificate authority. First, it's gonna have a table of names and the corresponding public keys for those names. So in our particular example, uh, the CA might have the name amazon.com in its logical table. And this might correspond to PKS in our diagram over here. So that the CA somehow knows that this is Amazon's public key and other keys correspond to other names in the system. That's the first part the certificate authority has to maintain, some, some kind of a table like this. It's gonna be responsible for connecting names to public keys. And then it's also need, gonna need a cryptographic key in order to participate over the network. So we'll call this uh, 
PKCA for the public key and correspondingly a secret key, SKCA and the public key. Make sense? And what's gonna happen is that we'll have to have sort of two answers for how to get data into this table and how to get data out of this table. So getting stuff into this table is kind of a registration process. So a server like Amazon is gonna have to talk to the CA and say, please register my name, amazon.com, in your table, and here's my public key, PKS. And as long as the CA believes this is a reasonable message coming from the real amazon.com, it should add this entry to its table. And then what's gonna happen is that the certificate authority is gonna take sort of rows out of this table and sign them. That's what a certificate really is. So the response to this registration query from amazon.com is gonna be a certificate. And the certificate is gonna be basically a signed message with the secret key of the CA. And inside of the message are really two things plus epsilon, which we'll describe, discuss now. First is the name. This is amazon.com. That's the one important part in the certificate. The other important part is the public key. Here it is. And then there's other fields. The real certificates, as some of you guys have explored in the browser, have lots and lots of fields for all kinds of good and not so good reasons. Uh, but maybe the most interesting thing to talk about here is there is an expiration time, expiration date of some sort, that uh, bounds how long the certificate should be valid for. So the certificate is gonna get sent back to the server, and this is a promise from the certificate authority that this public key corresponds to this name as far as the CA is concerned. And then the way we're gonna sort of plug this into our protocol is that the server is now gonna respond with the certificate here, just to sort of hope maybe make things clear, I'll add this new stuff in blue. So the certificate gets added and sent back to the client uh, by the server. And this is gonna convince the client that it's actually talking to the real Amazon server now instead of some impersonator in the middle of the network. Questions about this? All right, so in order to make this fly, the client is gonna to have to make a couple of checks here. Uh, so first of all, the client needs to actually know what the public key of the certificate authority is. So this uh, public key of the CA has to be baked into the client somehow. This typically happens uh, when you install your browser, the install package comes with a list of CAs or maybe your operating system like Windows ships with a list of CA public keys to begin with. And uh, there's you know, dozens of active CAs and probably hundreds of other public keys you might end up with there. It's a long list. Um, but then given a particular certificate, the client has to actually make a couple of checks. So when the client uh, gets a, one of these certs, it has to check, of course, the name field in the certificate. So it better be the case that the name in the certificate, like amazon.com here, in this cert that it got, is exactly the same as the name it was trying to connect to. If that's a mismatch, then you're pretty clearly trying to talk to one server and you're getting back a statement, this is a different server. So that's, uh, the client should reject that. The client should also check that uh, the public key of the CA is one of the public keys that it trusts. It's one of the pre-assigned public keys in its sort of list of trusted CAs. It needs to, of course, check the signature by the certificate authority on the certificate itself. It should check the expiration date. So if the certificate has expired, maybe that statement should no longer be relied upon. And then uh, finally, it should also check probably the public key of the server that the certificate is talking about the same public key that it's about to use. If you get back one public key from the server, but a certificate saying the real public key is something else, uh, the client should not use that public key. So that's the basic machinery for certificates. Um, so roughly speaking, we're augmenting the key exchange protocol with some kind of a signed statement by a third party called the certificate authority that maintains a table of everyone's public keys and can give us these citations from the table in the form of a signed message. So that's what these certificates are gonna help us with. Any questions about that? I have a question. Um, the client checks, who's actually doing the checks? Is it the browser or? So yeah, so here, yeah, of course, yeah. So sorry, I should have mentioned, yeah. By client, I'm sort of implicitly saying it's the browser like Firefox or Chrome running on your computer. 
and uh, it's doing all these checks for you. And what you see on the screen is probably like an address bar where you type this in, and then we'll talk about in a second, uh, well, I guess uh, what's gonna happen is the client, if all these checks work out, then you get this like lock icon in your browser window uh, saying everything is good, uh, and then the page loads. Yeah, so the, the, your browser software is performing all these checks, and the browser software has some configuration of all these trusted CA keys that it comes with. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Um, yeah, I, I was wondering how does the browser update or keep track of the public keys of the certificate authorities? Oh man, yeah, this is like a whole policy debate. You see, you read all these mailing list entries, they're like, ah. Basically, there's a committee of browser vendors, roughly speaking, and certificate authorities, uh, like Chrome, IE, Firefox, and uh, various CAs, Symantec, Verisign, et cetera. Uh, and uh, these guys uh, you know, try to convince each other that like, the CAs are doing the right thing and the browsers trust the CAs. Um, every once in a while, something bad happens. So roughly speaking, I think it's very rare that a new CA emerges. The main example I know from the last probably like five or 10 years is Let's Encrypt, which was a pretty uh, big development in the issuance of certificates. It's basically a new CA that will for free issue certificates to anyone as long as they follow a particular protocol we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, the CA list got populated kind of by Netscape when they started doing TLS or SSL way back in the mid 90s. They needed a whole bunch of CAs to start issuing certs, so they trusted a whole bunch of entities that wanted to come along, roughly speaking. Uh, and then since then, what's mostly happened in that list is that entries get removed if some CA does something horrendously bad. Uh, and even that happens after, you know, dozens of email messages exchanged on that mailing list. It's all public actually kind of amusing reading if you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, there's a whole policy politics sort of side behind this that sets this list. Uh, it pretty much always comes from your operating system or browser vendor though. So it gets updated when you update Chrome or you update Windows. It's like a long winded answer to that question, but a good question, yeah, thanks. Other questions about this? All right, so one thing to point out is that um, an alternative design you might think about is like, why are we bother signing these entries? Like here's a server that's perfectly good. We can just ask it, right? So why do we jump through the hoops of signing these certificate messages and having the server relayed here? How about we just have the client just talk to the C directly and say, oh, hey, how about amazon.com? Do you have an entry for it? And then the reply back might be, uh, yeah, sure, here it is, PKS. And the whole thing could be over an encrypted protocol with a known public key of the certificate authority. We already know what it is. So this is a potential alternative protocol. Some systems work like this, not certificate systems, uh, but for example, PGP does something kind of like this. There's public key servers that you can just query to look up anyone's public key in the PGP world. And the reason this doesn't work super well or some of the downsides of this stuff is that it's not necessarily clear up front which CA you should query. If there's a hundred of these CAs, you don't actually know which one to ask. Another problem might be that actually the CA is now a performance bottleneck and an availability bottleneck. So if you had to query the CA every time you connect to a website, that's gonna add an extra round trip to everything you're doing on the internet, which is pretty high in terms of overheads. And if that CA goes down because it's getting requests from everyone now, that's gonna break the whole web. <laughs> no HTTP client is gonna be able to work now if the CA doesn't respond to these requests. Another problem is that the CA would then get a list of what websites everyone is browsing at any given time. Every website you browse, you would send a ping to the CA saying, oh, I'm about to visit amazon.com. Please uh, give me their cert. So this is not a great design from sort of a performance, privacy, security perspective. Um, and uh, the use of these signatures is kind of a clever trick that puts the CA outside of the common path for performance and availability reasons. So if the CA goes down for even a week, not a disaster because all these certs are still out there signed. Maybe new websites can be signed uh, by this one CA, but maybe you can just go to a different CA then. So that's the setup uh, and sort of one commentary about why the CA system is particularly cool uh, because it puts the CAs outside of the sort of critical path of browsing websites. Questions? All right, so 
the thing I wanted to talk about next is to just really step through uh, some hypothetical attacks to first convince ourselves that this certificate plan is actually going to work and uh, what happens if an adversary, let's say, steals a certificate or tries to do uh, a couple of different attacks. Uh, so we'll look at that and then we'll try to then jump into various extensions to these certificate schemes to see where things fail or don't go as well as we hoped and what people have done uh, over the years to try to patch that up. So let me erase all this stuff and then we'll talk about how these certificates actually try to block uh, man in the middle attacks, which is the class of attacks we've been talking about where we have an active network adversary that impersonates the real server instead of allowing the client to talk to amazon.com directly. So these man in the middle attacks that uh, I sort of alluded to, are roughly, the, the setup is the same from the client's perspective. You as the user still type in something like HTTPS amazon.com, or maybe you click on a link or you have a bookmark for it. And this causes your server, just to remind you what the picture was, to connect somewhere, maybe to the right uh, server. But in this case, let's suppose that the adversary intercepted the network and what you end up connecting to is to the evil server that's impersonating amazon.com not the real server. And now we're going to talk about what happens if this evil server responds with various sort of attempts to fool the client into thinking that it really is amazon.com, everything is working out fine. And to keep in mind that there is a real server behind the scenes somewhere here. So there is the real Amazon server with a PK of S and an SK of S, and there's a search for the real server. So this guy's out here somewhere but the evil guy is blocking us. We're not able to, is blocking the client. The client is not able to talk to the server. So what could the evil adversary do here? Well, one thing they could do is uh, maybe send their own public key, PKE. But the protocol expects some kind of a certificate. Um, so we could steal the certificate from the real Amazon server. The Amazon server helpfully sends the certificate out to anyone that asks. The rules are if you connect to Amazon, Amazon will say, here's the cert, go for it. So the evil guy could grab that cert and include it in its own response, trying to fool the client. So include PKE, but the cert of the real server S. So what's gonna happen now? Well, the client is gonna look at this public key and the cert and Notice that the public keys don't match. So the public key that the evil server is proposing, PKE, is different from the public key that's inside of the certificate, cert S. So that would be a bit of a problem for the adversary because now the client will close the connection right away. It sees that something funny is going on. Now, the adversary could also try other things. So it doesn't have to use Amazon's stolen certificate. So a stolen certificate seems to be hard to use because it's got Amazon's real public key in it, but the adversary wants to use their public key. Other thing the adversary could do is maybe get a certificate for some other domain name, evil.com, why not? So then the adversary could instead send PKE and a search for E, which is basically says evil.com corresponds to PKE. Now, this is a valid certificate and probably E could grab that certificate if it really owns this domain name and it'll have the right public key. But now the client will say the name doesn't match. In particular, the client knows that the browser knows that the user typed in amazon.com, but the certificate came back for evil.com. It's a perfectly good certificate with the right public key, but it's not the server we want to talk to. So that gets rejected as well. The other thing the evil adversary could do is respond back with a different combination, which we haven't really talked about yet, which is maybe it'll send the right public key for Amazon and the stolen certificate from Amazon. So it gets the Amazon certificate and Amazon's public key. Now, from the client's perspective, everything matches up. But here's the cool thing. If this were the case, if the adversary did this, then it's almost playing into the client's hands 
where now the client will encrypt the session key that we're hoping with the public key of the real Amazon server. And now the adversary is unable to decrypt the session key because it doesn't have the secret key on the real Amazon server over here. And now basically the adversary has gotten himself into the situation where they're not in a position to decrypt the subsequent data that's going to be encrypted with the session key. They could of course still block communication. That's hard to prevent here, but the adversary is not going to be able to eavesdrop or inject messages into our secure channel now. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Why, why do you send the public key along with the certificate? Because the certificate already has the information for- Yeah, so the, the reason key, this right? is like a simplified diagram on the board. Uh, the real story is of course that you don't, uh, well, the real story is always complicated because TLS is extremely complicated, but indeed there is no deep reason why the public key would have to be sent separately from the certificate uh, because indeed the certificate does talk about it. One reason why you might end up sending it anyway is that in real TLS, there's actually a whole bunch of certificates that you might send that form a chain from the CA to an intermediate CA to then another CA and then finally to the end host. And all these guys have their own little different public keys and uh, certificates underneath signed by the next guy. And uh, it might be still useful to have the public key that you're expecting to key exchange with. So you're absolutely right that this diagram in this simplified protocol is redundant that yeah, the, the cert has this public key and this public key is also appearing on the outside. You might or might not need this in a more sophisticated real system indeed. So maybe to then uh, sort of build on that, if that were the case, if the public key was not separately included, then this is like not even a possible thing. It would be silly for the attacker to try this. Like the only thing they can really send is the search, which has of course its public key or the sort of Amazon, which has Amazon's public key. Any other questions? All right, so what could the bad guy do in this case? This seems like a pretty good protocol so far. <laughs> so what goes wrong? Like why, why might we not achieve security in this situation? <laughs> what might go wrong? Any guesses? All right, so let me maybe uh, propose a couple of things that I think end up being problematic for HTTPS in this case. Um, basically, ends up being the case that the, the, the technical core that we just discussed is pretty much a pretty good protocol. It does work. Um, so adversary, as always, uh, in these other protocols sort of nibbles around the edges. And the edges here are at the input where the user figures out who they, where they wanna go. And in terms of the certificate authority, issuing the right certificate. So one thing that goes wrong is that maybe the user types in the wrong URL, or maybe they click on a link that is not quite what they intended. So if, for example, if you get an email asking you to visit amazon.com with a zero, well, if you're not super careful, you might think that's fine, but this protocol is now guaranteeing something else. It's guaranteeing you're talking to Amazon with a zero. That's maybe not quite what you want it to uh, happen. Another possibility of what might happen is uh, maybe you're not careful about HTTPS. Maybe somehow you end up at an HTTP URL for the real amazon.com or Amazon with a zero. At that point, it doesn't matter. If you're not using HTTPS, if you're just doing regular HTTP, then none of these defenses apply. So it turns out to be pretty important in practice, uh, especially if you're typing in a URL by hand, often what happens is the user types in just the domain name, like. I click on the address bar, I type in amazon.com, hit enter. If I don't explicitly type in HTTPS, then what will happen is that my browser will try to connect to the server through HTTP. And if that works, maybe the server will redirect me to HTTPS. But this is the SSL strip attack that the paper talks about. The adversary could just force me, force my browser to use HTTP if the user didn't explicitly ask for HTTPS and the client doesn't otherwise know to do that. That's another sort of vector uh, that goes wrong here. And uh, the last thing that I alluded to is basically if the CA, uh, you know, misissues certificates. So if the bad guy here 
could get a certificate that says Amazon.com is equal to PKE, that would also be pretty damaging for us uh, because it undermines this whole assumption that the CA is only going to issue correct statements about uh, key ownership in this system. Make sense? That's sort of to, to, at a high level, the things that go wrong in this picture of certificates uh, is sort of either the CA is trusted and shouldn't have been, or the user sort of isn't checking the right things we're expecting from the user. All right, so it's probably useful to try to figure out what are the guarantees that the system gives us. So um, what can we expect? So suppose that you're browsing some website and you get this, uh, you, you go to some URL and you actually get your lock icon, which uh, we were previously talking about. The server checked the domain is, matches the certificate. The certificate matches what the server's public key is, et cetera. And the browser actually tells you amazon.com, the lock bar, lock box. Uh, what can we assume? Well, the thing that I think this protocol gives us the positive version is that really we're talking to an approved server in some sense. So it's approved in the sense that some certificate authority out there thinks that this is indeed a server for amazon.com or the public key for amazon.com. And the server we seem to be talking to knows the corresponding private key, which is uh, pretty good, excludes a whole bunch of attacker servers that hopefully don't have that private key. But notably, this is not really a statement about the security of whatever you're going to do on that website. So if you were about to use that website to submit some important confidential data, or if you're going to type in a credit card number, email message, whatnot, then this protocol isn't really guaranteeing that. So the things that, for, for example, doesn't really cover is uh, all the JavaScript that's going to run on this website or any of the forms that the web page contains or links. These are all things that uh, you know came from an approved server or the approved server created a link to that JavaScript code or a form that appears in your page. But it doesn't really say anything about the trustworthiness of that data. It's just sort of network level, sort of secure channel uh, protection. Um, another complexity comes from the use of content distribution networks or CDNs. So if I'm hosting my website on some CDN like Akamai or Cloudflare, then clients probably are not going to be talking to my server having my private key. Instead, they're going to be talking to some Akamai server of which there's probably thousands or tens of thousands around the world. Now the question is, what's going on? How is that server going to have my private key? And uh, one answer is uh, in some situations, you just give your private key to Akamai or Cloudflare, and they will use your private key to sort of impersonate your website. Uh, so now the approved server is any Akamai server in the world or any Cloudflare server in the world. That's a sort of a complicated story, uh, but really the right way to, I think, think about uh, the guarantees you're getting in, in sort of the overall web security sense is that uh, you're getting some document that resides on a server that the owner of that domain approved of which is uh, maybe a little bit less exciting than the guarantee you would have wanted, which is it's okay to type in my email message or credit card number into that web page. But uh, good to understand this stuff. All right, so that's the sort of story of what certificates actually are gonna give us. It does protect against these men in the middle attacks we considered here by virtue of making sure the public key you're using for the secure channel matches the domain you're expecting to go to. It's crucial that the user really is involved in checking the domain they either want to go to or they check the domain they ended up on by looking at the screen of the browser at the address bar to see where are they right now. Um, right. Any questions about this part of the story for certificates? All right. So if there's no questions, well, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, so I'll try to move on now to talking about various defense schemes or sort of what might go wrong in various settings and uh, what people have tried to do over time to uh, make it better or alleviate some of these issues. So let me 
erase this again. And we'll start talking about uh, one problem, which we already sort of saw on this board right here, which is how do we name the servers we're connecting to? So the thing we were just talking about is that the web browser displays to the user the domain name at which the user is currently browsing. So this question of naming becomes crucially important to the security provided by certificates uh, because the user has to connect sort of logically in their head the name that the protocol thinks they're connecting to and the expectation of the user where they want to end up and who they want to trust. And the sort of tension here, if you will, is that the protocol really provides naming, uh, but what the user and sort of system designers almost would want to provide is some degree of trust that the user should be able to trust a certain uh, in network connection. So the base kinds of names we've been talking about so far have been domain names. So things like amazon.com. And uh, this is how most certificates operate these days. Uh, this is actually called uh, domain validated certificates or DV certs. Uh, we'll talk about domain val validation in a second. Uh, it turns out to be critically important and there's lots of interesting details to get right there. Uh, but the problem is with these kinds of names is that it's really up to the user to figure out what this means. And uh, in the case of Amazon and the examples I'm giving, of course, it seems like a simple answer. You know Amazon.com the string, that's the right answer. But for uh, websites that are not maybe the top website in the world, uh, this becomes more murky. So if you wanna go to some website of a local you know, server or some, some local business, you might not actually know what domain name is theirs. Who knows what, what's the business name of like a local restaurant in my town. And then they want a credit card number. That might not be uh, easy to answer. Um, so one uh, alternative that the certificate authorities uh, sort of cooked up that they've been experimenting with, I think mostly hasn't really worked out well, but uh, nonetheless, is this notion of having a different kind of a name that hopefully gives more sense of a trust uh, and in particular, trying to represent the name of the business you're actually talking to. So instead of having the certificate connect the public key to a domain name, one thing the CAs have been trying to do is have a name like Amazon Inc. in maybe Seattle, Washington. That's the name that is in the certificate. And this scheme uh, was called extended validation or EV certificates. So this scheme, sort of the, the, the goal was sort of twofold. One, hopefully give the user a name they can more easily understand or check. So a user might be able to know that a name like this represents the entity they wanna to talk to compared to some domain name, especially in the case of things that are not Amazon, literally. And the other was to hopefully give some more sense of trust that only legitimate trustworthy businesses would be able to get these extended validation certificates. And sort of the, the stick that the browser or the, you know, the CAs cooked up with the browser is that uh, if you had an extended validation certificate, you would get a really nice looking lock box in your browser. Uh, and this would say, you know, in your browser right next to the address bar, maybe you guys have seen some of these, it would actually say, you're talking to Amazon Inc. from Seattle in your browser before the URL, this whole thing would be like solid green. Uh, so the intent was that to give the user more assurance that uh, this is a good certificate and it's worth trusting this site and here's who you're talking to. So on the technical side, what this really boils down to is a more elaborate protocol for proving between the server and the CA. So if you recall, when the server is gonna send its name and its public key to the certificate authority server, they probably have to attach some kind of a proof here to convince the CA that it really is a server with this name like Amazon sending this public key. So we'll talk about these proofs in the domain validation case in a bit. That's sort of the common case you see on the internet today. But for extended validation, this proof becomes much more elaborate and it really sort of takes the form of probably a bunch of paperwork that uh, you have to submit proving that, oh yeah, you're this incorporated entity. I am an employee. 
that is authorized to get certificates. I'm not just, I don't know, some, uh, you know, administrative assistant at Amazon whose job is to, you know, I don't know, uh, do customer support as opposed to, you know, get certificates. Um, so all, all kinds of paperwork has to be baked into this process by CAs to figure out how to authenticate these requests for a certificate for extended validation. And the hope was that also only sort of legitimate entities would be able to get this. It hasn't really worked out super well for two reasons. One reason it hasn't really worked out is because users didn't really know what to make of this green thing appearing in your URL bar in the web browser. They didn't really know, well, this is sort of guessing what the users wanted or didn't want or whatever. Uh, but users basically didn't really, didn't really expect this green thing to appear. If it didn't appear, their behavior didn't really change very much. Uh, so this green bar indicating an extended validation search didn't really change their mind much. And the other thing is this sort of paperwork requirement sort of raised the bar a little bit for getting a certificate for the bad guy. But the bad guy didn't really have to get one of these fancy certificates. They could get a regular cert and the user wouldn't be that unhappy with it either, uh, even though uh, maybe they should have been expecting an easy cert. And second, the bad guy can probably forge this paperwork just as well. Uh, this is going to be probably the form of some kind of a document scanned in as a PDF, emailed or faxed to the CA with a signature. The CA doesn't really know who this entity should be. They're maybe going to see if it's reasonable, maybe go to a state business registry office and see if that's a legitimate business. But it's not really going to allow the CA to vouch for whether this is a good business or not. That is sort of the initial goal, but that turns out to be really hard to do. Maybe it's just a, an attacker that is motivated enough to fill out some paperwork in a PDF file. So that's one thing that hasn't really worked out super well in the certificate world is trying to certify something more than domain names in the form of these EV certs. Questions about these EV certs and what works or doesn't. All right. So that's sort of a, maybe a bit of a negative story in terms of what uh, happens in the CA world. Um, so basically everyone mostly sticks to domain validated search these days. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit, how domain validation happens and uh, how to get that right. So the question we're sort of faced with these domain validated certificates is that the certificate authority has to know whether a request is coming from the right domain owner or not. So domain validated certs, DV certs. The setup, just to remind you again, uh, is we have a ser server like we had on the previous board here. Uh, they're trying to talk to the certificate authority and convince the CA that they are, let's say, amazon.com and uh, here is the public key for the server. The question is, how should the CA make sense of this request? How do they know this is amazon.com talking to them or not? So in this space, actually, the story has gotten quite a bit better over the last couple of years. It used to be the case that the CAs had all kinds of different ad hoc schemes for checking whether a request is coming from the legitimate owner of amazon.com. There are a whole bunch of things. The paper actually mentions a couple. Uh, so one is the CAs used to send an email to something like admin at the domain you're trying to register, in this case, amazon.com. So you might send this email and the email has some sort of a special link you gotta click or a special code you gotta enter. And if you're able to get this email, well, that means you're allowed to register certificates on behalf of amazon.com. There's other setups as well. So instead of maybe getting the admin email, another scheme might be, you know, you use Whois. This is a registry system for domain name owners. So the CA could query this Whois database. And the Whois database has some kind of contact information for every domain registrar. And maybe then the CA can send a text message to the phone number there or uh, call that person in principle. Uh, Another scheme 
Another possible, another common thing that CAs used to do was uh, they would require that the domain owner would put up some magic token, special file on their web server. So basically the CA would request the plain text URL, HTTP, you know, amazon.com, the domain that's being registered or getting a certificate for, and then there's some sort of a, you know, challenge.txt there. So if the user can stick a random string that the CA chose into challenge.txt on their website, well, that probably means I got a request from the real domain owner. So there used to be a whole bunch of ad hoc schemes like this. Um, it was actually not so great that they were so ad hoc. Well, there's two problems here. One is that um, these schemes are not really based on anything super hard in terms of cryptography. So what you can see is actually all these schemes are sort of hoping network security is working without TLS even. So like this email is just a regular email sent over SMTP over TCP. Who is queries are not encrypted maybe. These challenges are going over regular HTTP. There's no HTTPS we can use yet because we don't have the cert yet. So this whole bootstrapping of certificates turns out to be a real weak point for issuing certs for CAs. Uh, that's what they were trying to fix with extended validation to some extent. It hasn't really worked out that well. So one is that there isn't really a root of trust that you can really base these decisions on. You gotta sort of hope that the network works. But the other sort of deeper problem or maybe orthogonal problem was that there was no standardization on, on terms of what kinds of challenge you should issue to the domain owner to get a cert. So the amusing anecdote that the paper has is that uh, someone figured out that uh, uh, the webmail system live.com that uh, Microsoft ran the sort of successor to Hotmail, if you will, um, allowed users, of course, to register email addresses. And they registered the email address, something like SSL certificates at live.com. So this was just a, some user that just wanted this email address. But it turns out one of the CAs at the time thought this was an okay way to check domain ownership. So this one user registered an email at live.com and then convinced that CA in question to send this challenge to their email address. And therefore they were able to get a, that CA to issue a certificate for live.com. That's also a bit of a problem. So the nice thing that sort of happened in this space really is um, some standardization of this challenge protocol. Uh, so there's now a fairly standard uh, challenge protocol called ACME or acronym for stands for like automated certificate management environment or something like this. Uh, but basically it's a sort of a standard set of challenges. And at least the nice thing here is that there's like a standard URL on your website where you're supposed to stick a randomly generated file and that proves that you're the domain owner. In particular, uh, the nice thing is uh, you could, as a server operator, you could make sure no other user sticks stuff at that URL and you know exactly what that URL is and UCA shouldn't surprise you with a new magic URL you have to protect. Um, so that's, that's one nice thing that's happened in this space is uh, now there's agreement on how we should have CAs authenticate domain ownership in this way. And the prominent uh, certificate authority that implements this is a CA called Let's Encrypt. Um, we're doing quite a bit of cool stuff in the space these days uh, and that's sort of accessible to anyone publicly for free uh, has been quite nice for adoption of TLS and certificates. So that's the domain validation sort of story. Any questions so far I should ask? All right, so one thing I wanted to sort of highlight about this is the, this is indeed a weak guarantee as we've been talking about. So even with the standard ACME protocol that defines how CAs should check for domain ownership, it's still the case that uh, adversaries can probably fool a CA if they're particularly uh, inclined to do so. So one thing you should notice is that all these challenges, both before ACME and in ACME, really rely on DNS to work correctly. So in particular, if the CA wants to send a challenge to amazon.com, 
they have to look up amazon.com's domain either for sending an email or for loading this HTTP URL. And they got to look up the IP address through DNS. So if an adversary is able to subvert DNS through several possible attacks that we've talked about, um, that would mean that maybe the challenge is going to get sent to the adversary instead of the real owner of amazon.com. And now this guarantee isn't really particularly strong. The adversary can answer the challenge. And therefore, the adversary can send their own query to the CA saying, I want a certificate for amazon.com with a different public key. And by answering the challenge, they can get the CA to issue that cert. So that's one problem. IP level sort of attacks also work. Uh, because even if DNS is secure or somehow is correct, uh, the CA is going to open a TCP connection to this HTTP server, for example. That also could be subverted. Um, and uh, there are sort of two answers here. One is that we could try to do a little bit better. So what Let's Encrypt does, for example, to mitigate some of this, is they do what's called, uh, for both of these attacks, it's called multi-perspective validation. So what I mean by this is that instead of having a single CA server issue these challenges to the domain owner, what happens is that Let's Encrypt actually runs multiple CA servers. It's the same logical CA, but multiple CA servers distributed around the world, maybe in the same kind of data centers, maybe different data centers, different pro providers. Uh, and when a client or when some website owner or domain owner asks for a certificate, Let's Encrypt is going to get multiple of their CA servers to issue this challenge. And the benefit of that is that it requires the attacker to intercept the network in many different places. So if just this CA was issuing the challenge by issuing this HTTP request, then intercepting the network path between this CA and the server would suffice. But now if many CA servers around the world are going to issue the same challenge, the adversary might have to intercept more network connections around the world, or perhaps you know, spoof DNS records in many different places at the same time, which might be more difficult for the adversary to pull off. Although still, of course, not impossible. And also not impossible if the adversary can intercept the network very close to the target server's address. But nonetheless, this multi-perspective validation gives us sort of a better guarantee as to this website or this domain owner seems to be able to respond to challenges, not just in one place in the network, but from several vantage points around the world. And hopefully that means that other clients should also trust that this is the, the right amazon.com we're talking about. Hopefully that makes some sense. And the other sort of nice thing about this guarantee and this sort of standardization of domain validation is that it really sort of pins down or makes precise what the guarantee is. Not really precise in the cryptographic sense that we can pin down exactly who that is and what they did, uh, but precise in the sense that it really makes clear how weak of a property this is uh, that the CA is checking. That's not sort of ridiculously weak that we should just ignore it. It is a useful property. Uh, but uh, it at least makes it clear that you shouldn't assume much more from a certificate than the fact that several CA servers around the world try to go to that domain and they all sort of agreed that this, you know, went to the right place at the time the certificate was issued. So it's kind of a formalization of the weak but still probably useful property that these certificate authorities are providing with domain validation. That makes sense? Questions about this domain validation plan and how this relates to security. All right. So, so that's what sort of people have uh, done in the certificate issuing sort of in, in term, on, on the CA side in terms of how they uh, issue certificates to various uh, names and domain owners. Um, so the thing I want to talk about next is um, a problem of revocation. So in our discussion so far of this certificate uh, setup, we've been assuming that once we issue a certificate, as long as we issue it to the right guy at the time, 
we should be pretty good because we had the right server. So if, for example, if a server passes our domain validation checks, or if the server passes our extended validation checks, then we should be in good shape in terms of them being secure. The problem is that there might be various things that happen after the certificate is issued. So for example, we might have a server where the secret key gets stolen by the attacker. So someone breaks into the server for amazon.com and grabs the secret key, SKS. So it's kind of damaging now because it means that this attacker can impersonate amazon.com. There's a certificate out there that's saying the corresponding public key really is amazon.com. And similarly, if a domain is transferred or sold, uh, this is also a problem because the previous owner of the domain might have a certificate for that domain name for a public key that they know the secret key of. So one example here is Facebook's purchase of fb.com, which used to be a domain owned by someone else, not Facebook. And that previous owner could have gotten a certificate for that domain name for their own public key. And when Facebook bought this domain, there's no way for Facebook now potentially to uh, reclaim ownership and to invalidate this prior certificate. So the way to think of this is that all these signed certificates, all these signed statements are still valid. Once you've signed a message, it will keep being a valid signed message from that point on. And it doesn't matter that the secret key got stolen or the domain got sold, the clients that might get the certificate in the network protocol will still think this is a perfectly valid signed message from the certificate authority. So people have tried to solve this problem in various ways. There's basically three schemes for how to do revocation of certificates. Seems kind of important. Uh, I should say like this is a sort of a second order concern, if you will, because uh, this only turns out to be a problem if you sort of have domain transfers or keys, keys getting stolen. Uh, which is, you know, happens, important to get right. But nonetheless, like, you know, the world would be not horrible if we didn't have revocation. And for a long time, actually, as a result, we didn't have revocation working very well in uh, TLS certificates. Um, but uh, here's the schemes that people have sort of experimented with and uh, settled on uh, to try to deal with this problem because it does turn out to be important in some situations. So the setup is we have a client as before and the client is trying to talk to some server over here and the server so okay so the client connects and the server is going to back send back some kind of a certificate and the question the client now is facing is is this a valid certificate is this still a certificate that tells me the server's public key or has this certificate been invalidated for some reason like the secret key was stolen or this is now a different domain owner and all these schemes are gonna involve the certificate authority in some form or another, because it's really the certificate authority that had this table of names, mapping domain names to public keys. And it's gonna be the certificate authority that has to now make a signed statement saying, that's no longer the case, sorry about that. So the certificate authority at some level has to maintain a table of revoked certs. And this table just sort of has, you know, cert one, cert two, Etc. The stable probably gets populated when the server owner tells the CA about a compromise or uh, about uh, purchasing a domain or sort of you know claiming ownership of a domain. So there's some protocol that is not super well specified and varies by CA, where you can sort of you know ask the CA to please revoke a cert. And uh, you could imagine one way to tell the CA the search should be revoked is if you can sign this revocation request with the private key that corresponds to the public key in the search. This basically means you know the secret key for the entity in the request. Uh, so you should represent that entity. And if you can sign a request, you should be able to stick your search in the revoked list. This would allow a current owner of a certificate to revoke their search if they suspect their secret key their private key got stolen. Or maybe you can authenticate this revocation request through domain ownership. You could say, oh, you know, fb.com is now mine. Please revoke the previous cert you should for fb.com. The protocol for doing that is a little bit CA specific. Uh, 
But uh, the next step is how does the client check if the certificate that it's seeing from the server is one of the revoked certs in the CA's list? So this protocol is now at least CA specific in the sense that given a cert, we know which CA we should be checking because the cert claims to be from a particular CA. It was signed by some certificate authority. So the first protocol that people cooked up uh, in this space uh, is called the Certificate Revocation List or CRL for short. And this protocol uh, involves basically the CA publishing a URL that contains all the revoked certs. So the client, if they wanna check if, if a cert is revoked, they should basically grab a particular URL like HTTPS, you know, maybe ca.com slash CRL. And that URL will be just this whole table all in one file. And the web browser should probably grab this reasonably often to get fresh entries in that CRL. And the browser sort of has a cached copy of the CRL for every certificate authority that the client has seen certs from. And in the CRL plan, this is sort of plan number one we're gonna talk about, um, what the client does is the client checks if the certificate that it received is in the set of the CRL for that given CA that they've downloaded. Make sense? Questions about the CRL, certificate revocation list plan for revocation management. has a good property that you can indeed revoke a cert and the clients will hopefully grab this URL back from the CA. A um, couple of downsides, of course. One is that, oh yeah, maybe a question. Yeah, so I could imagine a case where the cache uh, is no longer up to date. So how, how does it deal with that? Yeah, so in the CRL plan, um, basically the browser has to keep downloading this thing periodically, probably like you know every day or every week, you should grab the new CRL because maybe it's been revoked since you last checked a week ago. Um, so that's one reason why this is not such a great approach because it requires a client to download this whole large database of revoked certs, could be potentially you know, as big as how many servers there are on the internet, even though I just want to talk to one guy. So it's a little bit of a pessimal scheme in that sense. Um, it's also um, not great in the sense of availability. So here's the way in which this has basically not worked out well, which is browsers want to allow users to visit websites. And if the CRL is unavailable, so for example, like this request times out or the CA is down, no browser vendor particularly wants to put up an error page saying, well, you know, I tried to connect, but I couldn't connect to this other website that you've never heard of before. And that's blocking you from visiting Gmail right now. Uh, that's basically like the proposition that no browser vendor wanted to do. <laughs> uh, so it's not feasible to require the CRL to be accessible whenever the uh, browser wants in order to visit websites. So the fallback plan must be that if I can't get the CRL, I'll assume everything is fine. Otherwise, this is gonna be a giant DOS vector for the entire internet. So that's one reason why this hasn't really worked out super well. The other reason being that it's sort of a large database that all the clients have to download at all times. So that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, the other protocol that hopefully it answers your question, please interrupt if, if not. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, super. Um, other questions? All right, um, so the other plan that uh, got cooked up after the CRL plan was a protocol called OCSP. This stands for Online Certificate Status Protocol. And the way this protocol works, it's really trying to address this shortcoming of having to download the entire CRL list. So the protocol works by having the browser basically query the particular domain name they want or the cert they want. So the browser sends the search they want to check to the CA and then gets back a status saying, you know, okay or not. So this OCSP protocol has 
one benefit over CRLs, which is that the client doesn't have to download this whole list anymore. And it's always up to date. This query is kind of cheap. So there's no need to cache a giant list of stuff on the client side. You can issue this query every hour or every time you visit maybe, depending on how paranoid your browser wants to be. The downside of this OCSP sort of online plan is again, what happens if the OCSP server is not available? There's sort of two answers, right? One is you could allow, well, I guess there's three answers. One is that you could uh, reject the connection and say, well, sorry, you tried to connect to Gmail, but the OCSP server is down. You can't visit Gmail right now. That's ridiculous. No browser was willing to sign up for that plan. Uh, the other plan might be that you tell the user, hey, you know, this is kind of Gmail, but I couldn't check OCSP at the time and maybe your lock icon has a different color. I think no user is gonna notice and uh, not really a viable option. And the only other remaining option is you just allow the connection to keep going. So that's kind of an opportunistic check. You query OCSP, if it tells you no, then, oh, well, you're excited. If finally you found a revoked cert. But if OCSP doesn't get back to you within a minute, within a second, let's say, then you're just gonna allow the connection to proceed. And as a result, any attacker that's even reasonably sophisticated will just block this OCSP request, prevent it from going through, and then the client will just ignore the certificate revocation. So that makes the OCSP plan not super uh, <laughs> feasible or not super you know, effective. So the thing that people have figured out that kind of works is a scheme called OCSP stapling. So let me describe what this means. Um, so instead of having the client query the OCSP server at the time they're visiting a web page, instead what's gonna happen is the server will visit the OCSP server on the client's behalf. So what this is gonna look like is that periodically, the server is gonna take its certificate that it's got here and send it to the OCSP server. And it's gonna get back a signed message from the OCSP server that basically says that here's a cert, it's okay, and it's good for one week. Expiration time. So this is basically like a one week long promise from the CA saying, well, you know, as of this week, this certificate hasn't been revoked yet. And then what's gonna happen is the server, when it sends the certificate to the client, it's gonna basically send this OCSP stapled signature to the client as well. And the way you can sort of think of this is that you have this long lived certificate that's good typically for, I don't know, three months or a year. So this thing is kind of long lived. And then you have this fresher OCSP signature accompanying the search that tells the client, well, even as of, as of a week ago, things were pretty good. This was not a revoked cert. And here's sort of the cool properties about this stapling plan. Uh, no extra latency on the client side. Still getting a message in one round trip from the server, things are good. The CA is not on the critical path. Uh, as long as the server can talk to this guy once a week, it can get a fresh stapled signature to send to the clients. So even if the CA goes down for a day or two, no problem yet. And the CA is not on the critical path for the client either, doesn't collect the set of clients that are visiting various websites. So things are pretty good. The main downside of this sort of is, well, I guess uh, that uh, there's still a one week window when your certificate might be revoked, but you wouldn't know it but maybe this is an okay trade-off in terms of how quickly you can disseminate revocation to various clients. So this third plan, this like OCSP stapling, that's roughly what actually gets implemented today for uh, certificate revocation. The way this works is that certificates, as I mentioned earlier, they got the main, the important stuff in it, like the name and the public key. And then one of the extra things that could be listed in a cert is a Boolean flag that says, for this certificate, please require a stapled OCSP signature. So if this server like amazon.com knows that it wants to guard against possible future revocations, then it's gonna ask a CA to please issue a cert with this require OCSP stapling flag set 
And then when the cert gets sent to the client, either by the real server or by some attacker that might steal the cert and the key later down the line, the client is gonna expect one of these OCSP stapled signatures alongside because the cert says, please expect it. And then the good guy hopefully can always get a signature saying, yep, that cert is still okay, not revoked. And then the bad guy will have trouble within a week of stealing the private key, let's say, within a week, they will not be able to get that okay on the search and revocation will take effect. So that's the sort of trade-off that I think mostly gets implemented these days for revocation in practice. Make sense? Nikola, there was a quick question on the chat. Yeah. Uh, could we achieve this, and this is a, the protection against uh, uh, revocation, uh, with a non-stored in the certificate and served by DNS servers? Whenever the domain is transferred or the owner requests you know, revocation, the DNS effort can increment it. So yeah, so I think one thing that uh, we can talk about is uh, indeed uh, dealing with CA compromises. So maybe let me talk about, uh, I was gonna talk about CA compromises next and we'll sort of talk about how this uh, folds into uh, sort of distributing this information through DNS. Uh, I think the short answer is that if we trust DNS, then you could imagine a scheme where DNS records list not only the IP address to expect for a particular name, but also the certificate to expect or the public key to expect for that name. And in some other universe, this could have been a sensible design if DNSSEC was deployed and got used as a result. Uh, one problem is I think many of these things, as you can see, in successful systems evolve in sort of strange ways. And uh, this is an example of that. Uh, if we had DNSSEC, the world might have looked different, but in the absence of DNSSEC, uh, most DNS queries are not really authenticated. So it's hard to trust the result of a DNS query. And uh, as a result, so we're stuck with this slightly roundabout way of authenticating ownership of domain names and getting fresh information about which certificates are valid or not. Uh, but indeed, actually one of the schemes that uh, some CAs use and some browsers, some, some, some clients use, is to look up uh, what's called the TLSA record in DNS which contains a hash of the certificate you should expect for that name. And uh, indeed, to, for, for clients that support this, I think it'll work. My understanding is that no web browser does this, but some non-web clients actually follow this protocol for looking up certificates of uh, particular names. So in particular, so I wanted to sort of talk about this DNS-based uh, uh, certificate checking. Uh, in the context of CA compromise. So the reason I wanted to sort of talk about it in this context is because um, there could be a number of problems arising if you accidentally or some, somehow end up the CA with a CA issuing a certificate that has the wrong public key for a particular name. So if a client, let's say, wants to go to gmail.com and uh, connects to it, uh, and what we get back is a certificate that has uh, the real name gmail.com, but the attacker's public key, the public key of the evil attacker, then, then we're in trouble, right? So, and this might be for many reasons, uh, might be because of uh, the situation we had earlier where the domain ownership changed. So maybe gmail.com or something like it was recently purchased. And this is the certificate of the previous owner and now we have a new owner, but it also has other attacks, right? Like, so maybe the CA itself got compromised because there was a bug in the CA software, or maybe the CA was fooled through domain validation into approving the wrong public key for a given name. Or maybe there was like an employee at that CA that was not trustworthy and uh, tampered with the CA's internal system. So there's many reasons why you might end up with a CA issuing the wrong cert. Uh, it happens actually surprisingly often uh, like, I think every year there's been some interesting story about a certificate being mis misissued to an adversary for all kinds of different reasons. The paper has a couple of links that are interesting in that regard. Uh, but it is an important problem to deal with uh, because it does show up and it shows up in situations that are sort of high value, if you will. And the answer in general to these kinds of CA compromise stories is to do some form of key pinning which means that uh, the client has an independent view 
of what it thinks are the legitimate certificates or public keys for a given name. That's almost independent or like some, somewhat independent at least from the CA's view of what should be legitimate or not. So roughly speaking, the client maintains some kind of a table that says here's the domain and here's the you know, hash of search to expect for that domain. And uh, maybe the domain in our example, gmail.com. And here's some hash value for the Gmail search we should expect. And the main question in these key pinning strategies for dealing with CA compromises really ha ha comes down to how do you populate this table? I should say this key pinning approach seemed like a great idea, something like five years ago maybe, or maybe a little bit more, seven years ago. And then since then, it's sort of fallen out of favor. Um, we'll talk about various ways to populate the table in a second, but roughly speaking, the reason it's fallen out of favor is because it's really easy for server operators to shoot themselves in the foot with this key pinning approach. So for example, I'm thinking that I'm gonna set up Nikolai's you know, web store and I'm gonna get a domain name. I'll pin my cert because I wanna defend against CA compromises. And it's like, well, maybe a threat I should worry about, but a bigger threat might be just like, ah, my hard drive crashed. I lost my private key. I can get a new cert, but it's a different cert. And I pinned my old cert in everyone's browser already. And now all of my customers, when they visit my website, are gonna expect a different cert and they'll get a horrible error message saying, Nikolai's website has been compromised. It's using the wrong cert. And uh, this actually happened way more than CA compromises. And for that reason, uh, this key pinning plan mostly has fallen out of favor. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's sort of interesting to see how you might populate tables like this because various approaches like this still sort of show up in various forms. So the most straightforward way in which this works and maybe the one that still gets used is uh, this stuff might actually get baked into the browser. So this uh, works well for extremely popular domains. So like gmail.com or google.com, amazon.com. That, th that thing is literally baked into the Google installer executable for the Chrome browser when you download that from Google. And uh, it comes with the certificate of Amazon and Google and Facebook and all these popular sites pre-baked into the browser almost for you, uh, or at least a hash of the certificate authority that you should expect those uh, domains to be using. And this is actually what caught a number of these uh, CA compromise attacks in the past. So in one case, I think uh, there was a web browser in Iran, if I remember correctly, where a user was using a Chrome browser to visit gmail.com or mail.google.com, I think. And uh, the browser had baked in the CA it was expecting to sign all Google certificates. And the browser saw a different certificate signed by some new CA that it's never should have been signing Google search before. And the browser actually sent this error report to Google and that allowed Google to figure out, ah, oh, yeah, someone actually misissued a certificate for google.com and is sort of impersonating mail.google.com in various places. So that works well for super popular things. If you can get your cert into the browser uh, and then you can get a browser update if, if it turns out you lose your private key. That's like super high value stuff. Uh, another plan that uh, people have tried is to infer this list from history. So as you're browsing the web, you remember what certs you've seen for various domain names or what CAs you've seen for various domain names. And if that changes, then you raise a flag to the user. It's pretty okay, pretty appealing because it's easy to deploy. It's similar to how SSH works. So when you SSH into a server, you're basically following a similar plan. Um, the reason this is not great is because as an end user, you have no idea if a cert changed for legitimate reasons, like Google changed the certificate authority they wanna use, or there's something else going on that's nefarious and you should really block that connection. It's not kind of hard to pin down. Um, then there's sort of server supplied uh, through headers. So there's a, there used to, well, still is a standard header that's deprecated called HTTP public key pinning uh, uh, has a couple of headers that the server can set to basically inject elements into this table in the web browser. And this is the thing that I was saying is the most error prone that server operators would shoot themselves in the foot with this mechanism. And then the last thing is sort of DNS based uh, publication, uh, uh, population of this table through a protocol called Dane, 
which is basically a DNS record of a special kind like gmail.com can have a record of type TLSA, and that has the hash of the cert you should expect for gmail.com. And uh, this works in some applications, notably mostly non-browser based things. The reason this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in the browser in the world we have today is because DNS really isn't secure. So DNSSEC is not widely deployed for reasons that I probably don't have time to explain in the rest of this lecture. Uh, but um, if DNS is not secure, then doing these checks through DNS is actually probably even more harmful than good because if you can spoof a wrong TLSA record for a popular domain name, this is now a good DOS vector for that domain name. So maybe it's not even a good idea for availability reasons. That's sort of the story for DNS or DNS uh, sort of interaction with certificates as well as other key pinning strategies. Um, so I need to wrap up given that we're out of time here. Um, the certificate plan that we've been talking about turns out to be a pretty good idea in general. You see forms of it of almost infinite different kinds in various protocols that get deployed, uh, super widely used. I think the high bit is pretty successful. So that's moderately hard for an adversary to uh, impersonate a website with HTTPS. Uh, but as always, there are sort of pitfalls uh, as we've talked about. First off, it doesn't provide maybe the strongest guarantee you would want for end-to-end -end security. It provides a much more narrow guarantee about the client talking to a particular name of a server. And maybe the user isn't even aware of what the right name should be. And there's various technical issues that we talked about, like dealing with CA compromises, domain validation, revocation, et cetera, for which there are solutions here and there that are sort of good to keep in mind. All right, so that's it for this lecture. Uh, I'm happy to take a couple of questions if students, uh, if anyone has them, uh, but feel free to also run off to your next lecture as well. Are there any remaining questions? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way uh, if it would make sense to have like a distributed public ledger for the key, the key chains. Yeah, uh, so there's I a mean, whole sorry, bunch of certificate things people have tried to do. Yeah, people have tried to do a whole bunch of stuff in this space after being disappointed by CAs and how it's panned out in practice. Um, one thing you might want to look up is a system called Namecoin, which is kind of a you know, name to public key mapping system that runs on top of a blockchain. It's not super widely used, but it has interesting, cool ideas that you might sort of, I think are probably closest to, to what you're asking about. And the cool property here is uh, there's no single CA entity that's trusted uh, and anyone can come along and register a name. So maybe the main point to take away from this name coin system is that there's a big difference between systems that try to register first come first serve names like if Nikolai.com is not registered, I can register it and register my public key versus other systems that try to reflect some existing ownership of names. So if, to, if you try to capture existing ownership of names, like what the CAs are doing, you're basically up a you know, endless hill because you have no idea who owns the names already. You're trying to do all kinds of heuristics with domain validation. It's gonna be horrible. You will never be fully correct. But if you define correctness to be first come first served, things are actually much better. So Namecoin does that. There's another system uh, called Keybase that you should look up. It's kind of a hybrid uh, between sort of CAs and using multiple authorities. And you can sort of think of it as maybe a variant of PGP's, you know, web of trust model. Uh, the guy who runs, founded Keybase is gonna give a guest lecture, hopefully in a couple of weeks in this class. So you can look at it and maybe ask him questions when he actually does the lecture. Uh, but that's sort of maybe the main things happening in the space post CAs, if you will, although nothing's really replaced CAs in practice. Thank you. Any other questions before we close up? Sorry for running over. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, feel free to, you know, chat or send us questions over Piazza, but uh, I'll stop the recording here. And uh, we'll see you guys on Monday where we'll have a guest lecture from uh, Max Burkhardt. See you guys then.